Today, we have the great pleasure of being joined by La Tierra del Jaguar's founder and director, Randy Young. La Tierra del Jaguar brings a vital new perspective to the work of healing the land. They work with local communities to ensure there are safe places for Jaguar to live. Their values and vision of empowering people to partner with nature and heal the land is very complementary to Scott Island Alliance's work and mission. And we know it will take many organizations working in alliance across the region to provide safe places for Jaguar to live and migrate through the Sky Islands. If you have any questions, please feel free to put those in the chat on Zoom or on Facebook, and we'll be sure to ask them at the end of the webinar. If you'd like to learn more about La Tierra del Jaguar, Ana will put the link in the chat for their website and Facebook page. And with that, we are ready to pass it over to you, Randy. Welcome. Thank you. Bienvenidos todos a La Tierra del Jaguar. Welcome, everyone. I'm Randy Young Villegas, and I've been working in the area of Sahuaripa, Sonora, for old years now. Um, that began when I had the honor to manage the Jaguar Reserve for NJP for three and a half years, and now working for our own nonprofit, La Tierra del Jaguar. Uh, during my time at the reserve, I saw firsthand the threats the Jaguar faces and also the opportunities to improve. Sorry, my slides aren't switching. I gotta. Okay, sorry about that. Um, during my time at the reserve, I saw firsthand the threats the Jaguar faces and also the opportunities to improve, improve life for the Jaguar, the communities, and all of nature. I say threats, but really it's only one threat, humanity. Specifically, a humanity that has lost its place as part of the beautiful web of life. We have driven nature to the point of extinction, ignoring that we are intricately part of that nature. Um, through ranching and agriculture and the systems that we do them currently, through mining, all of these different extractive practices are definitely decimating habitats. 40% um, of the historic range of the jaguar has been, has been lost to different forms of, of human use um, in a use that is not inclusive of nature and the jaguar. Uh, fragmentation of, population, of habitat creates isolated populations loss of genetic diversity and increased risk of disease. Um, and this is all you know, created as, as humans continue to take over more and more land and destructively use that land. The jaguar's preferred prey is often killed just for competing for water and forage, leaving jaguar's legal option than to go for livestock. Um, and in Mexico, as, as many of you may know or may not, there is almost no public land. This leaves uh, jaguar conservation and landscape restoration in the hands of landowners, AKA generally ranchers. Um, and this is where we are in the range of the jaguar there. Uh, we need a new vision of conservation that includes human needs. We must modify productive systems to partner with nature. Extractive land use equals habitat destruction. And this are, these are some of the lands that have been cleared for buffalo grass. So everything else cleared from the area. And down here, buffalo grass is still a common thing to be planted in. So I know, I know a lot of people think it's something that has been eradicated from our worlds, but, uh, or is being eradicated from our worlds forcefully, but it, it's definitely a real thing here. Um, and uh, so, um, this is a book called Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations, and I put the cover up here because th in this book, David R. Montgomery details how human movements and wars from Mesopotamia to the Roman Empire to Ur European colonialism and even the U.S.'s push westward have all been necessitated by the misuse of soil. Um, there's writings from Plato, there's writings from um, our founding fathers all talking about the, the fact that, you know, the, the, degraded, the degraded soils creating the need to conquer new lands that still have fertile soil. And this has basically been the story of humanity. We talk about civilizations crashing due to, um, you know, basically extractive agriculture and, and those things and the lack of, of regenerating the soil and, and treating water as the highest commodity we have. Um, so regenerative agriculture shifts that paradigm. 
So the ideas of regenerative agriculture are to partner with nature and protect the soil, increase biodiversity, and look at everything from a holistic point of view that takes in you know, nature, every, every component of the soil as you go through it. Um, the jaguar is the apex predator, so we see it as the top of the food chain, and we often um, select what we protect because it is that top of the food chain place in order to protect everything below it, we protect that key pyramid species. And um, basically in order to truly protect it with the levels of degradation that we've created, we have to start at the very base. We have to start at the soil in order to make the differences that can let our world begin to replenish itself and really grow and be, become abundant. Um, these are some examples of what can take place through large scale. Um, this is the La Plana, and this area is the cradle of civilization for China. This is um, the equivalent of a Fertile Crescent, and just like the Fertile Crescent, it had become completely deserted from over extraction, over overuse, and so. Um, the Chinese government, the world, um, the, I, I don't remember which the, the which of the organizations was involved, but but several organ, large organizations got involved and did this giant project to restore this area. And this area is what gave the Yellow River its name by this yellow soil of this land eroding down through China. And so they did these huge restoration works, um, most of them done, done actually on the humans scale with people out there with picks and shovels and converted these lands from being extremely degraded to being back to some of the most productive lands they have. Um, and in doing this, they did some really interesting things where all land over a certain slope, they designated as not fit for agriculture, which meant that it was regenerated and left as natural open space. So that began to really create native corridors through this land that they were regenerating and, and becoming fertile and creating fertility in again. Um, landscape restoration creates a huge change in a very short time uh, by creating structures that hold the water, whether it be by rocks, with soil itself, with plant matter, with whatever it is that you build up, you create things that will stop and slow the flow of water and then absorb into that soil. And while you do that, you start to correct, collect um, soil itself, the topsoil that is eroding away, and you start to collect organic matter. And by raising organic matter by just 1%, um, soil can retain an extra 20,000 gallons of water per acre. That's just 1%. Imagine when you start to really have thriving soil again, the kind of difference you're creating. So this is a, a picture of, of a type of agroforestry system. Um, there's a lot of different systems with a lot of different names, agroforestry, silvopasture, um, a whole lot of different things that mean almost the same thing. Um, there's slight difference and slight branding differences that help people to be able to designate exactly how they're going to do it. And different ones fit better in different climates. But this kind of gives an idea of how you can divide up a landscape and each of those areas that you're seeing there are all sinking and slowing the flow of water. So by creating these, these works on contour or just slightly off contour, you really start to collect water, collect topsoil and create fertile land from things that have been overused and degraded. Um, and there's been systems created of agroforestry that um, have been developed with intercropping of mesquites and agave. And the mesquite beans are used for a very high protein, high quality flour. Um, the agaves are used, of course, for bacanora, our um, version of tequila in the region here. And, um, but the pruned leaves from the agaves and the mesquite beans that aren't suitable for flour are fermented to create a high protein probiotic fodder for livestock that is really a um, huge, uh, boon to the to the health of that livestock. So um, that's something that is created with what would be considered the waste from these these plants. So these types of systems that start to magnify benefits and multiply benefits are what are key to, to 
implement in order to start to really change how people see their relationship with agriculture, with nature, and with diversity in general. Um, so utilizing the framework of the food forest, which is basically derived from the framework of the true forest, um, we can interplant crops and plants that serve functions in the ecosystem. This protects, flat, protects the crop plants, adds diversity, and supports nature through creating um, systems that are much more um, similar to the native systems and, and really do invite in the native wildlife and the native uh, pollinators and, and stuff like that. Um, and here's a bunch of the different things that, that benefit from that. Once you create these, you know, these once way degraded overgrazed lands into being healthy little mini ecosystems, you start to have all of the soil bacteria, the organic matter, the protozoa, the fungi, everything working with you. And we've often ignored the life in the soil, but it is what creates all the life above it. It's what makes the plants, the nutrients available for plants. And then those plants make the nutrients available for our livestock and, and, and on and on. So without paying attention to what's going on in the soil, we really can't change the systems that we have currently. Um, so here we have something about intensive farming, which is, you know, our, our basic types of agriculture that we do now, which are mostly monoculture systems. And they do create a very high yield of that product, you know, of whatever that one product is on that landscape. But um, diverse agroecological agriculture or different forms of regenerative agriculture give multiple benefits as well as multiple products. So you're not completely tied to that one grain, its selling price, and whether or not you have a severe thunderstorm or hailstorm that um, depletes that source. So that's one of the key things of, of having a multiple yields from your land. Um, different, like I said, different systems are branded and named in different ways in different areas. And in, uh, principally in Africa, these types of regenerative systems are being called conservation agriculture. And um, it's basically sustainable farming based on crop diversi diversification which decreases pests, disease, and weed pressure. Um, this is really an important thing that diversifying the crops that you're growing makes it to where you don't have one kind of pest destroying your entire livelihood. So that's one of the important things that happens when you start to diversify your crops. Um, and then minimal soil movement. Um, a lot of people consider tilling to be essential for um, growing of crops. And when you till the soil, you kill all of the different bacteria and, and life in that soil. And that can be um, you know, highly detrimental to what you're trying to do. And that requires you then to use chemical inputs in order to get the production that you're wanting. And basically that puts you in an adversarial state against nature. And so whenever you start to build soil life, you start to build resiliency in that soil and the crops can grow without all of those inputs being um, so highly toxic and so highly expensive for the person who's doing the work. Um, and soil coverage with residue with residue of the previous crops or cover crops, um, this is another key thing to keeping that soil alive. Like I said, when you till off that soil, you lose all of that life, but you also lose a lot of the water that lands on that land it, it then rushes off the soil crusts over and you don't end up with the infiltration you would have um, and you end up um, basically desertifying the landscape by running off the water and um, anytime you're not um, having a crop on the land so it's very key to have cover crops and to have multiple systems going at the same time in order to um, keep life in the soil and keep water infiltrating into the ground. Um, these are just some principles of regeneration that I, that I um, found online. And um, I think that it's uh, a, the point of view that it brings about is um, what I think is important about this. Um, so thinking in the long term, um, short term 
bought on profit is, is what has caused a lot of the problem we have now is trying to extract all we can from a piece of land and then move on to a new piece of land. That's what's creating the deforestation issues we're seeing in, in the Amazon, in Mexico, and all over the place is um, overuse of the soils and a lack of um, treatment of that soils and giving the life back to it. And so that's a that's a key a key issue is not thinking long term. Um, and then uh, solving issues and dissolving root causes is all about you know not not just looking at the at the minor symptoms but looking at the root cause of what's going on and working at it from a from a more direct point of view and with that long-term perspective um, inter interdependence fuels life this is about that interdependence of the plants the soil the livestock and all the different parts of that and how they they really do interrelate and and strengthen each other and create that um, life in abundance through doing it um, so uh, promote cascading benefits. Um, I had mentioned a while ago that you know the the parts of the crop that aren't valuable from that um, agroforestry system using mesquites and agaves are then even more valuable as a fodder for the cattle. And so instead of seeing that as a waste stream, you see it as another product stream and figure out how to use it. And that's one of the key things of these types of concepts. Um, adapt to change. I mean, we're dealing with problems that we've caused ourselves and we have solutions to most of those problems but we're not implementing them um, and once we start to implement them we're going to start seeing change and needing to adapt to it quickly and even in places where people aren't starting to adapt yet and things are degrading at a higher rate the need for that adaptation to change and seeing into the future and trying to prepare for that is key um, Nature inspires design and place dictates strategy. So the idea behind this is what I was talking about earlier is like the food forest concept that is developed from the different layers of a, of a true forest and knowing that all those can coexist not only um, well, but beneficially to each other makes it to where you can create systems that create multiple yields. Um, but then your place needs to dictate that strategy. Like I said, I mean, we're, we're talking about using, you know, um, agaves and mesquites in agroforestry, whereas in some places they'd be using much higher water need plants. Um, and, you know, in some areas you may be able to do things that are, that are more multi-species and, and, you know, vary outside of your zone a little bit. But that's only where you've already created microclimates and you're and you're adapting that soil and adapting that water and, and harvesting that water in order to be able to have that abundance to use. So place dictating strategy is very key to, you know, your place on the landscape. Are you high in the landscape where water is wanting to run away from you all the time? Or are you low in the landscape where you're dealing with bogs? Right. So your strategies have to be based on the place that you're located. Um, Diversity creates resiliency. I touched on this a little while ago with the with the fact that um, conventional agriculture, you end up with one crop and that one crop is you've got everything tied up in it. Whereas whenever you start to use regenerative principles, you end up with multiple crops, multiple different um, avenues of uh, uh, revenue streams. And that creates that resiliency and that ability to adapt over time and, and find out that, you know, your the water you thought you had every year is less than you thought and so you're, you're going to need to adapt what you're doing if you've only got one thing you're planning on working on it's going to be impossible to adapt and, and bounce from that um, and then focus on potentials instead of problems uh, this is kind of a key thing in life if you go through life staring at your hurdles they're always going to be too big and you're never going to get over them but if you stare at the way around that hurdle you'll find the way to find that path to get done what you need to get done and so that's that's a, a key strategy in life it's one that i always teach mountain biking if you if you look at the rock you'll hit the rock you have to look at where you want to go around that rock and so that's a that's a principle that is true in everything in life so definitely one to apply in every chance possible um some of that thinking, that different thinking about, um, you know, trying to find the solution in the problem. For instance, if you have a rodent problem, what you need isn't chemicals. It isn't, you know, some kind of, of uh, traps to be able to kill them and, and that kind of thing. You need an owl solution. 
Okay, so you set up perches, you set up nesting boxes for owls. This is being done by a lot of dairies and different types of farms in order to cut down rodent populations without poisoning our ecosystems and our predators. And so this is this is one of those regenerative principles is, is you can look on charts and find I'm having this problem. What is a natural solution to that problem? And those resources are out there. We just have to you know, find the ones that best match our region and our issues and utilize them properly. Um, this is um, about silvopasture, which is kind of a different name for agroforestry and some of the different things that are provided automatically by creating these types of systems as opposed to your basic, you know, flat open pasture with no other life, uh, which is only part of that. It also provides the cooling effect of a canopy and the small water cycles that help to keep us um, hydrated in, in areas. So those are those are key as well. Same trees are sequestering CO2 put out by that cat. Um, and the lagoons and soil microbes are, are absorbing CO2 and utilizing it to the benefit of us and our um, crops and our livestock. Um, and this is all preventing erosion and helping these areas to be resilient through that biodiversity. So there's a lot that takes place when you start to do some intercropping amongst your um, pasture lands. This is what's called market gardening. And market gardening, um, as you can see, is, is very much on the human scale. Each row is about 30 inches wide. And um, so the guy is there, he's, he's actually using a planting tool there to plant in that, that area. Um, pretty much all of these ranchers in the region here have um, cattle, you know, as their only reason for having their fertile lands, their, their crop lands are used for just feed for their cattle. And so you end up with, uh, with um, lands that are fallow a lot of the time and, uh, and then put into production for a very short period of time. So again, that erosion and all those things is taking place. So this is an opportunity for folks to be able to really create an income off those areas that are, that are minimally used currently. And it definitely saves water and um, energy use by the same size and scale that it's all done at. Um, this is again, some of the benefits of that windbreak. It, it reduces wind speeds, it enhances crop yields, and it improves soil structure. Those are kind of the, the main keys to that. So these types of things does increase the bounty of what you've got and automatically creates a much more living ecosystem all around it. Um, these are some of the experience practices and some of the key ones that I, that I, oh, I went too far, that I want to point out here are um, fencing off of waterways and plantings of riparian areas in order to slow the flow of water um, and integrating enterprises, having multiple enterprises on the land, like I had mentioned. So these are some of the things that definitely benefit nature and benefit the landowner in a very big way. Um, this all come back around to saving the jaguar a new gen of conservation um, setting aside lands for 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 animals and for different things that are at risk is is a key strategy that I'm, I'm, I'm not knocking that at all but the thing is is that humans have taken over way too much of the land for that to be our only strategy we've got to work more with those human populations to create abundance for both nature and humans and a knowledge that Without nature, we don't exist. And so that's what a lot of these systems are um, helping to, to, for people to see. Once they realize that they're partnering with nature instead of being adversaries, they automatically start to see the abundance around them as being more important. Um, and more evidence of how this all fits in with the Jaguar 2030 roadmap. Um, mitigating Jaguar ranch conflict. Uh, whenever you start to rotate your cattle, you are there more often, your cattle are grouped more closely, and depredation goes down immediately. Um, it's, a, it's a huge difference of what takes place uh, compared to cattle just roaming giant fields on, on their own. Um, it increases the connectivity of core protected landscapes by creating landscapes that are more natural feeling and more, na and more natural in general and relationships with those ranchers and stuff to protect jaguars as they travel through their lands. Um, and stimulating sustainable economic opportunities. Um, that's one of the key things to 
solving a lot of the problems of these communities. So globally, we have a move of people from rural areas, from agricultural lands into metropolises. And there's work being done to make that more green and, and better. But generally speaking, that means that there's very few people left to grow our food. And you end up with large, large industrial systems doing it. And that just isn't healthy for people or the land. Latira de Tawara's mission is to save jaguars by teaching skills and empowering people to partner with nature and, the land, and heal the land. Um, so regenerative agriculture techniques strengthen species diversity, improve water quality, and reduce human jaguar conflict. Landscape restoration is the key thing to, as, as the base of all these systems. Things are so badly degraded and water runs off all our topsoil so quickly. Um, and so once you start to restore the land, you really do increase the security and connectivity of the habitats all around it. Um, because that degraded land isn't suitable for much better than any wildlife at all, but also there's no cover for predators and stuff traveling through it. So they don't want to travel through it and they end up staying in the few areas that they have that coverage. So it, it definitely breaks up connectivity. Um, and the economic opportunities, like I just mentioned, are a very key thing to stimulate sustainable development and the regenerative economy as alternatives for traditional ranching and mining. Um, there's a lot of different opportunities for products and systems that that partner with nature you know we've got um, so many different things when you go to a, to a farmer's market these days there's the soaps the lotions all these different things that are creative with with plants and animals that are that are from our region there's so much work that can be done there that i think that the the, the beginning to develop those things locally here where almost everything that's used here is imported will be key to, to start to create a, a more live regenerative economy in the region. So we're currently building out our demonstration site. We're, we're constructing a classroom and workshop uh, with a little dwelling for living on top. And um, this is going to be a sustainably built building. We're doing uh, mostly earth bag build for this, what's called hyper adobe. Um, and you can see the, the top there is all solar panels. So that's um, a shade for the structure in order to reduce heating and cooling needs and everything is built with uh, you know, positive solar gain and all that kind of stuff in order to start teaching these systems locally and changing how people build their dwellings and the carbon footprint that comes up with them. Um, we're also using as many recycled materials in these as we can. All of the windows and doors and stuff and the electrical outlets and all that stuff have been things that have been removed in Tucson um, during remodels and different things like that and are now being implemented down here as opposed to buying all those things new. The solar panels all came from the community food bank of Tucson. We purchased their whole system and that's what's been helping move us along. There's Cholo there instructing all the workers. Cholo is the little Chihuahua there on the bottom. He's our, um, definitely our crew supervisor. He keeps us all in line. That's after he got a bath in the concrete. Uh, We've got a wonderful local crews that are working with us. And, uh, one of these folks is, is actually a biologist that's looking forward to work with us in multiple other ways once we get the build. Um, there's Cholo in charge. The trincheras are one of the things we've been working to bring back all in the area. They're an ancient form of building that, that clears pasture land while constructing the fences. And um, I'd asked lots of people about building in Cheras, and everybody told me everyone who does that kind of work, everyone who works that hard is dead. And I found this man here, Nacho Cordero, and he's a master rock, rock mason and been teaching me the Tera systems and has been building our Trincheras for So we're very thankful to have um, both members of the community that are very involved in our project. The area is highly diverse. This is the river um, just beyond our demonstration site. Some of the critters basking in the water there, enjoying it. A few more views from the area there. Here's a, a little bit of bird diversity in the area in just a short time. Some of the different ones we have, in, including the squirrel cuckoo and the caracaras. And we've, we've got a whole lot of different things. We've seen all the eagles and um, military macaws fly over the demonstration site. So the southernmost area for the eagle, northernmost area for the macaw. 
Um, this is David Attenborough quote that I think is very true to our lives right now. The future of humanity and indeed all life on earth depends now, or now depends on us. Um, and I think that's a key thing to, to realize is that we have caused enough damage that we can't expect nature to bounce back on its own, at least not in our lifetimes. We have to do that work ourselves. Um, soon we'll be having volunteer opportunities for folks. You can sign up on our website for that. We'll be doing uh, builds for the, the, the buildings themselves for the site, as well as the demonstration site being built out and the different systems being implemented. Please visit our website. And thank you for your support. Gracias por su apoyo. That's um, the that's the entire presentation. If we want, we can switch to take any questions there be. Yeah, thank you, Randy, for the great overview of the work that you do with La Tierra del Jaguar. We are so excited to see how it all develops, and um, we are also really excited to partner with you more in the future, maybe holding an event in that demonstration site. Uh, it's just so exciting to see the work that you're that you're um, that you're doing. Um, if anyone does have questions for Randy, please go ahead and start typing those in the chat now, uh, either on Zoom or on Facebook, and we'll make sure those get read. Um, one thing that really struck me is how your work is connecting things like food production and water infiltration, soil regeneration, all of that to overall ecosystem health. And it's, it's no longer that idea of let's put aside all this land for nature. It's let's do that, but also let's make sure that we can have some of that land for, for us as well, but use that land very smartly and use it regeneratively. Um, and I just think that's fantastic. Um, one thing that I, that I really uh, enjoyed hearing about was some of those, those ideas around cattle wildlife conflict and how you were managing that, suggesting different management practices. And we actually had a question about that already uh, in the chat. Um, are you finding that ranchers or others are receptive to the sustainable ideas? And is that true on, on either side of the border? So I'm hoping maybe you can spend a little bit of time talking about that. We are having um, quite, a, quite a few people being receptive to the concepts, um, but I think that the demonstration side is key to truly teaching the fruition of those concepts. Um, we have brought in folks and done a lot, a lot of restoration work on a bunch of ranches. And the ranchers are like, stack your rocks over there where I'm not going to trip over them because cattle hasn't been taken off that land. So it hasn't regenerated. It hasn't a chance, that grass hasn't had a chance to seed and start to, to sprout. What does sprout gets trampled. So it's definitely a key to show the systems through fruition. We have a lot of examples of that in Southern Arizona, but there's a lot less of them on this side of the border and definitely none in our region here. So it's key to show how to develop nature and also the need for that process. Okay, um, you broke up a little bit at the end there, but I think you were saying that um, that the demonstration site in particular is key to being able to show uh, show kind of the end result and not just the um, the uh, sort of initial steps where maybe people don't quite see yet the the benefits of the regenerative work. Um, yes, that's correct. Okay. Awesome. Um, so we have a couple of questions coming in from Amy. Um, one is, uh, hopefully, um, could you share a little bit more about where the demonstration site is? Uh, and then related to that previous question, are you modeling the rancher Jaguar conflict resolution off of the work that has been done with wolves in the US? So maybe even a little more about that rancher Jaguar conflict, uh, um, and then more on the uh, demonstration site, if you don't mind. Okay. Um... So I'm, I'm scrolling up to the map real quick. Here we go. So you can see we're located basically directly south of the Arizona, New Mexico border. Um, from Tucson, it's about an eight hour drive down to where we are mostly because beautiful river valley highways that you're driving on. So um, we're almost directly east of Hermosillo. You can see on the map there. So to kind of get an idea for, for distance in, in reality. Um, and if you go through Hermosillo, it's only a little bit shorter time, but I always have to stop in Hermosillo. So it's an overnight if we go that way. Um, but that kind of gives you the placement of the location. And the reason for where we are is we are 
The land is right next to the river um, and right next to the highway, right between the river and the highway um, in the communities that the Northern Jaguar Projects Reserve is based out of. So that's what brought me to this area and how I found this land and the demonstration site was through doing that work. And so that's why we are right where we are, but it's also um, kind of right in the center of the Northern breeding grounds of the Jaguar. So we're in a key place to be able to affect areas all around us into Chihuahua and things like that as well. Um, the Rancher Jaguar conflict resolution off the work that's been done with wolves in the US. So on that question, we're working, I would say a little bit more towards some of the stuff being done by, for instance, uh, the Cheetah Conservation Center in Africa and some of that kind of work. They're working much more with the communities, creating economic opportunities. Um, one of the big differences is in the US, we have a lot of public land that ranchers lease. And so the public has a little bit more say in what is done there. Whereas here in Mexico, it's much more private land. And so you're, you're literally um, having to convince the landowners to want to do the work. And so those economic opportunities and economic incentives to do that are key. In, and you know, showing how they're going to benefit from those systems is key to making that change happen here. Um, so I'd say a little different than what the, the situation is different than what it is in the US. Um, in the US, you've got a lot less uh, um, you know, impoverished folks that own large chunks of land. Uh, so that's, that's where one of the big difference comes in. I think that sounds that sounds um, fascinating. I think that was go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna say that sounds like a fascinating uh you know approach to to kind of have to um show people and it makes perfect sense to to show that this is how this actually is economically beneficial in addition to benefiting the land and the habitat for jaguar and everything else. It's really it's very holistic and it, it's it's a very exciting approach. It is and, and it, it needs to be where we are because of that, because of it being all private land, there's really that need for people to buy in and see the benefit of what they're doing. And, you know, overall people aren't gonna convert the, the jar itself to be benefiting them financially, um, other than through possibly ecotourism and some of those types of systems that will also be impaired. But it's um, the, once you start to partner with nature and see the benefits of the diversity, then the diversity in general becomes more understood and more appreciated. And so that's the that's the path of that. And also, folks like yourselves coming down for workshops and for you know um, different events that we'll be having on really help people to see that people are interested in nature. People people know that there's a value here and a need here, and that's what people's minds too. We've done murals in the area and stuff, and it really it really changes people's minds. And and just seeing it regularly makes it a, a symbol of pride. Um, the municipio here in Sawaripa actually just recently added a Jaguar to their logo. So it's now becoming a sense of pride here in the community. And that wouldn't have happened years ago when we were doing you know, the projects here in town. And so um, seeing that change in, the, in it as being a symbol of pride is a powerful thing to know that we are having an effect on the community in a very real way. Oh, that is that's just a what a wonderful story and what a wonderful uh, process that's happening right now that's that's very exciting. Um, it seems like that's all the questions that we have for today. Uh, once again, I would love to give a big thank you to Randy Young and La Tierra del Jaguar for joining us today. Uh, we will send out a link to the recording of this presentation um, this afternoon in case you'd like to watch it again or if you want to um, learn more about La Tierra del Jaguar's work. Uh, you can also catch up on our other copy breaks on our website. Anna will put that link in the chat now. Um, thank you once again so much for joining us, everyone. Thank you, Randy, for joining us today. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>